as a kid, I traded one obsession for another. Um, first obsession I remember is Legos. I was like crazy about my Legos. I'd make little Lego cars and see if I could make them strong enough to stand on. And then I got into comic books. And let me tell you, comic books are hard to find in West Africa, but some new kid would show up from America. He'd be like, you comic books? And I got pretty obsessed with comic books. And then I got obsessed with fireworks. Uh, we traveled a lot, and sometimes we'd go to places where fireworks were legal. If they weren't legal, you know, still managed to find some. And then in the summer of 1973, I was in Lesotho, Southern Africa, and I saw a Bruce Lee movie. I saw Enter the Dragon, and that's all I've ever wanted to do uh, since. The Korean government, on a, as a good sort of a goodwill uh, gesture, sent high-level Taekwondo instructors out all across Africa to teach in, in, in African countries that were friendly with, uh, with um, uh, Korea. And uh, so I started training with uh, uh, two guys, uh, Taeyun Pak and uh, Ma Yoon. Uh, Mr. Yoon heads up Taekwondo in, uh, in Kenya now, and Mr. Pak ended up as the coach of the uh, Korean, excuse me, of the U.S. Olympic team. So I started with, uh, I started with them. Then I came back to the States to go to school, and uh, I visited a judo school, an Aikido school, a Taekwondo school. When I walked into Taekwondo school, the instructor, uh, Suk Jong Chung, had his arm around Bruce Lee, and I, I knew where I was going to go. My mother wanted me to do Aikido, naturally, but that was like a bunch of fat, hairy people rolling around. And when, I, when I saw Bruce Lee and Mr. Chung, I, I, knew, I knew there's only one place on the planet I wanted to be. In the early days, it was scary as Fuck, I mean, it was terrifying. You know, Taylor Tooley, 350 pounds, flying towards you, and people's teeth flying out, and teeth stuck in feet, and no. And then, every UFC, you'd be like, there'd be one guy, it'd be an eight-man bracket, and it'd have like Mark Kerr, and all these killers, and then there'd be one guy who was an ambulance driver from Miami, and I'd be like, I would fight that ambulance driver. And that was 95 or something like that. And then we started putting on um, open hand. A friend of mine, Kip Kolar, started doing um, grappling tournaments and open hand, uh, open hand things. That was like 98. So I think in 99, I had my first one of those. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was wicked nervous. Not, cause, not from getting hurt. Cause it's like a, there's no knees and elbows. It's a slap fight. It, you get hurt more in training. Um, but your ego is, you know, your whole sense of self is, is on the line up there in front of hundreds or thousands of people. And that part of it's very, very hard. But the, the physical, initially the physical part was why I was like, there's no way I'm doing this. But when I actually got around to the competition, it was just pancreas rules. And the, the physical side was nothing. But the emotional side was, you know, it was genuine. It was pretty big. You don't want to lose everybody you know. I look kind of fruity, so... Mostly what people say is just like shock, uh, not shock, just surprise. Uh, people are like, really? You fight? And I'm like, yeah, I fight, you know, sorry. <clears throat> so the, the usual response I get from people is, is just one of surprise. And um, I don't think I usually get beyond that with people. You, if you try and engage, people would talk about fighting a little bit who have no experience with it. You don't get very far. That They're full of preconceived notions about um, I don't know, Mike Tyson raping a girl or or the WWE and all the blood and drugs in it or I, I've never really been able to, to bridge the, that gap between somebody who doesn't know anything about fighting and and the reality of it in a single conversation so I, I usually nod and smile and talk about the weather or something I think well there's there's you can divide the public into into two halves, there's there's a portion of the public that still thinks it's human cockfighting. And um, they probably think fighters are demented, molested, gladiators with missing ears and teeth and not even worth talking to. And then you get the other half, um, and growing. Well, it's the world's fastest growing sport that loves the sport. Uh, and in my experience, fans that love the sport still don't know that Fighters are like normal people and better. They're nicer than the average lawyer I've met. Um, they're nicer than the average postman I've met. Um, 
so I think even fans of the sport have an idea that that, that fighters are uh, a lot more menacing um, and maybe you know come from a troubled background or or, or whatever than uh, than is actually the case because the case is fighters are nice usually there's there's exceptions but they're the exceptions that prove the rule fighters are usually nice normal well adjusted uh, people yeah I'm a friendly guy um, I, I try and leave things better than than I find them I think if I was completely confident I probably wouldn't fight um, why would you like you know if 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 if, if you had you know 2.2 kids and a stay-at-home wife and I worked as an architect and I wore a suit all day I, I probably wouldn't want to fight but I'm a human being um, I've got doubts about myself and, and issues to work through and fighting absolutely is a is a vehicle to to address those issues and uh, and, and, and try and try and make them positive Thank mm -hmm. you.